Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. Welcome back to the Lights Out Podcast. I am Miguel Iterati, and with me as always, the MMA detective, Mike Davis. Chris Lytle is off in bare knuckle land as usual. Very busy man, but uh, he has, we have his seal of approval for another historic podcast here. And we are going into jujitsu history. So I, I got my notepad out. I'm making notes. We have Marcus Suarez joining us. And, you know, there are people who are known as encyclopedias of jujitsu. Yes. This guy might be the library of Alexandria. You know, this guy is the fountain, according to many, many people. So we're honored to have you, Marcus. How are you? My pleasure, my friends, to be with you guys here. I'm doing good. I'm in Vancouver right now. I just came back from Brazil a few, few two weeks ago. Went to my ceremony to get my 90 degree. And did a seminar with uh, uh, a group we call Top 5 Seminar, that old generation Carson Grace students, me, Fernando Pinduca, uh, Peixotinho, uh, Marcio Santos, and Amaury Bittet is member of this Top 5, but he couldn't come. So we invite uh, Carson Grace Jr. to be with us there. It was very amazing. So Bittet was there as well? No, Bittet is part of the top five, but he yes. couldn't come. We replaced him with Carson Gracie Jr. Okay, okay. So Bittet, I mean, it, and like I said, first and foremost, every other Thursday, we're releasing um, a little bit of jiu-jitsu and wrestling history. On Mondays, we have our MMA history. Marcos, or Marcus, um, you go back to the beginning, and... A lot of our questions kind of stem from there, but on a side note, on a side note, Bittetch and Don Fry, that fight belongs in the UFC Hall of Fame. It yeah. is, when Bittetch came into the UFC, it was Hoist 2.0. He just had a bad matchup, like a bid, like kind of matchup with Fry. Bittetch is 1000% the real deal. Like he is a savage. Yes. I know. <laughs> I yeah. Know, since he was a kid, you know. <laughs> it, it, right, right. I, and I, I can't imagine that, but you start with Carlson Gracie. Um, would you mind telling us how you and Carlson met? Well, uh, my uncle uh, was friend with Carlson Gracie. My uncle was a genius, a very high IQ, and was the only guy who could beat Carlson in a game day. They call stick a palavra in Portuguese, is stretching the word, right? So you put one letter, the other one put one letter, and who formed the word loses the game, right? So, and Carson used to love to do this. He decorated the dictionary, his memory was incredible, but my uncle was a genius, you know, and they were friends. And my uncle took me to his gym one time, you know. And that's when I started, January 1970. And since then, you know, uh, I was a natural grappler because when I was a kid, I started when I was 13 years old. But since I was a kid and used to fight, I always go to the neck by instinct, you know, against the enemies. But anyway, when I go to the gym and they teach me how to do what I love to do, I fall in love with jiu-jitsu, you know, right place, the right person, and right time. So I became very close friend to Carson. Carson liked me because he always preferred the students that have the competitive in the blood. You know what I'm talking about, right? So some people come to the gym to make friends or get in shape, but that one's going to fight to represent. That's the one Carlson used to care about. So, okay. So, it. you got there when you were 13 years old, correct? Yes. Okay. Was Pedro Sauer in the room at that time already, or did he come later? No, 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 no. I know everybody. Pedro Sauer was not there. 
I saw Hall's Grace arriving because Rawls used to train with Hilio, but something happened there. He started to come to the Carson School, right? And I saw when he started, he used to train with Carson Grace, the best student, in my opinion, that was Sergio Iris, as no one, Serginho de Niterói. So this guy was very tough. I saw many trainers, him and Carson. Carson sometimes take 20 minutes to submit to him, you know? So and nobody usually left one minute to Carson. So this guy was a big deal too, you know? So he was... Uh, Holes, Gracie. No, no, Sergio Willis. Sergio, yeah. okay, okay. And okay. Sergio was in better shape than Holes when Holes came. Even Holes being... Younger, right? So Halls was maybe around 19, 20 at the time. And Halls and Sergio was 28, between 28 and 30 years old. So you're talking about, for us English speaking people, Sergio Iris. Iris, yes. Okay, so Sergio <laughs> Iris, just to kind of set this table, is known as Carlson's greatest student ever. Yes. And you saw him in Holes Gracie, who, for people at home that, that kind of maybe don't know jiu-jitsu, Holes Gracie is kind of like the James Dean of jiu-jitsu. He was the first person that kind of lived the lifestyle, surfer, long hair. The women admired him. The men were jealous of him. And he, in we were told that he was the greatest Gracie ever in regards to practicing jiu-jitsu, correct? Well, in tournaments, he was amazing, okay. right? He was super creative. He don't have a specific takedown. He fights on the mistake of the opponent. If the guy fail with the neck, he choke the guy. Fake, fail with the arm, he take one arm lock, one kimura, one whatever, right? So... He was the most creative fighter I saw compete in my life. Nobody came close, not even Roger Grace. That's an amazing competitor, too, you know. But the, the creativity and aggressivity of Hall's Grace, and he was only about 70, 72 kilos, more or less, you know. So, so this is 164 pounds, more or less, right? Yeah. So, very light, and he used to compete in his weight category in open class, all the tournaments, you know? And one of the tournaments, I saw something that I never saw before. He was very good in judo also. He, he applied one Hanagoshi on the opponent, and in the air, he landed arm lock. When fall on the ground, we just heard the scream of the guy, and the arm was super stretched already, right? So <laughs> this is very rare, you know? So he was an amazing fighter. But uh, I have to tell the truth, you know? He was really good, but I'm gonna tell you something. Carson Grace, my teacher, he was from another planet because, you know, against Halls in training, Halls had zero chance being who he was, right? So. And I saw this train, and nobody told me, right? So many people hear stories today, but when you is there to see exactly what happens, it's totally different. Okay, so Carl, we, we, we got a lot of different subjects here. Let me just kind of break things down. So Carlson Gracie, in my opinion, sometimes you know people have heroes like LeBron James, Michael Jordan, a baseball player, whatever it is. As an adult, you look for people that go above and beyond to that help the community. And those are the people you consider your, your heroes. Mm -hmm. Carlson Gracie seemed to take in lots of children from the street, teach them jujitsu, feed them, help mentor their lives. Could you just kind of describe what Carlson was like to our audience? Well, first of all, I used to call Carson Grace the son of Jiu-Jitsu, right? Because nobody, nobody never ever gonna shine as he shine. 
not only as a teacher, but as a person too. He have this big heart to, if you, if you like his shirt, he take it off and give it to you, my friend. He's a guy like that. And he did this many times because I saw, you know? And I call him the son of Jiu-Jitsu for the reason. This guy created a, a team that was an army in the 70s. And during 30 years, every single tournament we participated, we won the overall for 30 years, my friends. So he should be awarded as the instructor of the millennium because in 1,000 years, nobody do what he did. You can check any sport on the planet, you know? And nobody did, not even 10 years, what he did. So this guy, how I say, he's from another planet, you know? So mm -hmm. I mention well, him every day in my classes, you know? And people needed to know who he was and where I come from. Because gratitude in life is everything. I always want to mention Carson and, you know, his jiu-jitsu. I keep the legacy alive during my classes. So the interesting thing about Carlson is that one, his students and his ability to spot talent in children, like he, if he saw an athletic kid that could have been on a path of prison or maybe greatness within the sport, he grabbed that kid. Like he wouldn't let that child out of his sight. Exactly, exactly. And he did it at a time when there was no money in jujitsu, zero. Exactly. And there wasn't any money into jujitsu until the UFC came 30 plus years later. Mm -hmm. You can't fake that. You can't say, oh, well, he did it because he knew they were going to be superstars with the, with the UFC. No, and no, never. No. He have never even knew it existed. He just wanted winners, and he took kids from adverse backgrounds. Yeah, Castro yeah. always did what came from his heart, you know. Wow. So, and I try to follow his path. I'm the same like him, you know. That's so, not easy. That's not an easy path to follow. Yes. You can try, but wow, that's big shoes. Big Many gyms. You don't show the money, you don't train there. I saw many people, me, uh, I took one time, Carlos Santos, he has a school in the United States now, right? Him and Suyan Carois. Uh, he came to me and said, oh, I want to train in this gym here. And I told him, you want to be a champ, you have to come to Carson Grace. Oh, but I don't have money. I said, okay, you want to train hard because you are a big guy, right? So come with me, I want to introduce you to Carson. And I gave a scholarship through Carson to him, you know? So he became there and was one of the champions of the team too. Just one example for you guys see, right? So if you go there and show your interest to dedicate for the training, be a member of the competition team, Carson would hug you and do everything he could to help, you know? So that's the kind of guy Carson was. So Carlson would actually train his own students to face the Gracies, which would become just incredible, like incredible rivalries, kind of like uh, Waleed Ishmael. Yes. Uh, first of all, I would like to talk about the, the geniality of Carson Gracie, right? Because sure. uh, he had this power to go in the weakness of the opponent and train his student just to do exactly what the guy couldn't handle, right? So I never saw someone have uh, make this look so easy like Carson used to do, you know? And for example, Valid fought hands of grace and I challenged you one hour in Rio de Janeiro. I was there in this uh, competition, right? So, and in my opinion, right? I think hands of grace is way more technical than Valid Smail, but Valid Smail have a lot of hearts and custom training Valid to do 
two things to neutralize Renzo. <laughs> and he won the fights, you know? So it's very rare you see someone with this uh, intelligence to make things happen like that, you know? So, but Carson, he trained his students to go and compete. But Carson told me, and he said this many times in interviews also, he never ever would train one of his students to fight a Gracie in a MMA. Only sport jiu-jitsu, you know? I respect that. Yeah, and he do this, you know, how Brazilian people are. They like to make fun, you know, of everything. And he do this to make fun of his brothers, his uncle Hilio, you know. Uncle Hilio came to the gym to challenge his students, you know, came with Hickson, uh, came with Horium, you know, and later Horium came with Royce Grace to challenge. I was there, you know, when he came, and Carson said, start to laugh. Come on, Royce, you never won night here in Brazil, man. You John Doe here, you know. <laughs> Even my student in Dela Riva beat uh, Royce and his brother Hooker in the same day in the tournament, you know? So Royce was not very successful in jiu-jitsu tournaments in Brazil, right? Well, well let's, let's talk about Ricardo de la Riva. He's yes. known as having the best guard, like at the time, the best guard in Brazil, in the entire country of Brazil. He was one of your training partners, correct? No, no. Ricardo de la Riva, when he was 15 years old, he was 14, not even 15 yet, he came to train with me in my house. Okay. I have this huge apartment called Pacabana, 10,000 square feet, you guys have one idea. And the last floor, I did a little gym there with the constant of Carson Grace, right? I said, I said, Carson, have some guys here very good athletes, but they don't have money to pay the gym. I'm going to train these guys to reinforce the team in tournaments, you know? And Ricardo de la Riva was one of them. You know, I had other guys too, very uh, amazing. Some guys used to practice water polo, that in my opinion is one of the sports, give the best physical condition to you, right? And all the guys, thank you God, I took it to the eliminatories at Carson Grace School, my students always got to this point because only two guys were allowed to go in each weight category, right? It's not like, like nowadays when school send 10 guys to the same belt and same weight category. Before, it was only two allowed. The thing, the tournament was for the quality of the sport. Nowadays, it's for the quantity. They want to make the money, you know? But my generation was totally different. And nobody fights for points. We fight for submit. If I win the fight, I didn't submit the guy. I used to get really mad because the goal was submission, not to make points. So that's it. Let, let me ask you, in those old days with... Uh the jiu-jitsu tournaments, how many weight classes were there? Like, how, how defined was all that stuff? Because now it's crazy, you know? Like, everything is is in charts and details. And But in the old days, I get the feeling it was a little more crazy. Uh, look, in the old days, the weight categories used to be the same. Nine weight categories plus the open class. The... Okay, great. Absolute, right? So mm -hmm. used to be the same. Oh, okay. Fantastic. So very they organized. The they, they had some changes. For example, uh, the coral belt, 80 degree, used to be black and red. But a few years ago, Carlos Gracie Jr. changed it to white and red, right? So I don't even know. You know how this is possible. I think so. They should keep it the way it was before. That uh, Carlos and Hilo and other guys, João Alberto, the guys involved with the Rio de Janeiro Federation, that was the first federation created in the, in the world, right? In 1967. And I even fought the first official tournament in Brazil in 1973 
I still have the medals of the tournament. Look like a little keychain, something this here, you know. <laughs> but you keep it just to for memories, right? So, right. <laughs> Zero awesome. value, right? So. <laughs> so why don't we talk about the rivalry between Gracie Jiu-Jitsu and Luda Livre back in the day? How fierce was it? When did it start? What was your experience uh, watching it unfold? Well, uh, in my generation, we didn't have any rivalry because I used to study, I, I have two degrees in the university, right? I did the economics, after that I did physical education. In the university uh, that I study, Gama Filho, the owner, Pedro Gama Filho, is one of the main guys to help develop the sport in Rio de Janeiro, right? So his team in the university games, he hired all the best athletes, of the country, in all the sports, Gama Filho destroyed the other universities. Every single year was Brazilian champion in the university games. In judo, we didn't have jiu-jitsu, right? But judo, rowing, volleyball, basketball, soccer, every single sport, track and field, you know? So, have a very strong team. And Pedro Gama Filho helped one guy from the karate, this guy was even uh, brother of the Antonio Noki, the guy from Japan, just died. He had a little... Antonio Noki, yes. Yeah, Inoki Jr. It's funny because the Noki was a huge guy and his brother is very short, right? So anyway, Pedro opened the school for them, him, them and, and Paulão, and he kept the one room on the top for him to put the mats and he trained with his friends. But Pedro had friends from Luta Livre also. And I used to go there. Uh, Leitão Senior was one of the founders of the Luta Livre in Brazil and other guys from his generation too. They used to come to the room to row. And Pedro invited me to go there because I was good in Jiu Jitsu. But the funny thing is, the guys only would like to train with me without the gear that I didn't have too much experience. But for Jiu Jitsu guys take off the gear. You guys remember when Abu Dhabi started? Everybody took the gear off and fought very well there, right? So, yeah. but the guy training no gear, put the gear is another thing, you know? Sometimes I even tell to the guys, they ask, oh, what's the difference training gear and no gear, you know? I said, my friend, train without the gear is like having sex with clothes. You have way less options, you understand? <laughs> Just a joke here, right? But yeah. no, fantastic. <laughs> the gear gives way more options for you. The universe is way bigger, you know? So, but that's it, you know? At that time, we didn't have any rivalry. When it started, uh, people go out and could start to fight in the night clubs. That's how all starts, you know. And the fights in the nightclub night started. Club. Yeah. yeah, people shot each other. You know, Eugenio Tadeu shot people. He shot Renzo, but the bullet failed and shot Ryan. I don't know. It's a big. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. But and the thing went so bad that they decided to do the challenge in 1991, Jiu Jitsu against Luta Livre. And how everybody knows, Jiu Jitsu was well succeeded, you know. Well, 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 were there security concerns about bringing both of them into the same gym? Well, sometimes. They, they did the raids on the gym. They went to the place to Maita, right? A dojo storming. Yes. Yeah, right? So, <laughs> and happened to fight. Eugenio Tadeu fought Hoyler Grace there for over one hour, you know. And Hickson was supposed to fight, uh, but he fought the guy on the street. Uh, Hugo Duarte. Duarte. Exactly, right? So, some fights happened there, so the rivalry 
was big, you know? Sometimes uh, the Luta Livre guys walk on the street with a big group, you see one guy wearing a jiu-jitsu shirt, they rip the shirt off the guy off and burn the shirt, things like that, you know, crazy. <laughs> But now, yeah. nowadays, everything is calm and now don't have any problems anymore, you know? Many people sure. get together and even now, have I, together. I, I had read somewhere, I thought, that when you were, uh, you, you know, young, coming up, that you did some challenge matches when people came to the, to the dojo. That and, and actually, one with Hugo Duarte was what I read about. I don't know, is that not true? No, no, Hugo Duarte never came a challenge because Carson Grace have a, a squad very hard for not many people would like to, <laughs> to go there to challenge him. You know, once in a while, some people because in the 70s, karate was very popular, these movies, Bruce Lee and things, right? So they they go learn a little bit of this and they think they are the king of the world, right? So they came to check it out jiu-jitsu, to challenge it because they believe that the Bruce Lee style was nobody could defeat, right? So anyway, but all these guys came in. The fights didn't last not even 30 seconds. You know, we dominated the guys very easy, and we were not allowed to touch the guy with strikes, no punch, no kick, no elbow, no headbutt, nothing like that, right? So we just would clinch the guy, take to the ground, and make the few shit and let them go. Sometimes they want to try again, but most of the times, one time was enough. You know, when you hold the guy and make it hard, the guy breathes, they change their minds right away, you know? <laughs> That's the situation. <laughs> hmm. I had heard that you and Hickson rolled in one of those challenge matches. Is that true? No. Helio Grace always treated his sons uh, First it was Horton, after that was Helson, and came Hickson, right? And he tried always to find the best training partners for them to practice the techniques, right? Because how do you improve in Jiu-Jitsu? You improve with good instruction and good training partners. Have no other way to improve in Jiu-Jitsu, right? And I'm... Uh, two or three years older than Hickson, you know, I think so. I born in 56, I believe it. Hickson born in 58 or 59, I'm not sure. But when I was 15 and he was like 12, you know, I saw Hickson fight at this age. He was very good. He had very uh, tough match against Fernando Rosenthal. One guy was a student of... Uh, he came to Carson Grace later, but he was a student at uh, João Alberto Barreto at the time, you know? And because they didn't have too many tournaments, they used to come to the gym. Every gym bring a little group of fighters and they fight each other there, but it's no medal, no night, it's just to, to practice, right? But anyway, Helio Grace used to bring Hickson to train with my brother. My brother is not alive anymore, but he was really good too, you know? So I was older than Hickson. So at that time, you know, uh, too much uh, difference. Experience. Age. No, not experience, right? Because Hickson started probably before me when okay. I was a baby, right? So I started when I was 13 years old, but I learned really fast. Because yeah. it can be a big a, difference too with, with a 15 size, year old and a 12 year old. Maturity. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. My okay. brother how, was. How, here. how did you see Holes in that mix? How I told you, Holes was amazing. But against the Carson, my friend, he couldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> he was really good and he. Compete in everything, you know. He competed in judo, in jiu-jitsu, sambo, you know, wrestling in Brazil, uh, Greco-Roman style, you know, many different things. He he was 
ahead of the times. And I remember, uh, I even have some argument with Carson sometimes because how I said, I have a degree in physical education and I always care a lot about the conditioning of the fighters, right? Because if you get tired in the fights, your coach cannot help. What are you going to do? You mm -hmm. died, my friend. You cannot move, right? So condition is very important. You have to keep your tongue inside your mouth when you fight. You cannot be like a you know, dog tired, mm -hmm. something like that. And sometimes I... Carson was not uh, too much into this. And I remember in the 70s, me and Rawls was the first guys used to do extra workout to help the conditioning for fights, you know? So I got you. Wow. So wow. who was a black belt first, you or Pedro Sauer? I believe in me because I, I'm the guy did the... Carson Grace, the black belt list. I was one of the oldest one. I remember everybody, I have good memory. And Carson asked me him to help him to do the list, you know. But Pedro Sauer, I don't know, he was maybe a house or Hicks and student. I don't even know, I don't remember him in, in Brazil. At that time, Hicks didn't even had school, you know. So I believe I'm way older in the business than Pedro Sauer. I, I don't even know his age. I'm 66 right now, but I don't know how old Pedro Sauer is, really is, right? So, so, so Miguel, I have a successful school in the States, but I don't know too much about him. Okay, so that, that's a correction. So everybody that kind of follows our podcast, we're obviously history buffs. Um, historically speaking, it's listed as Pedro Sauer being the first person receiving a black belt under the Gracie name that didn't have that same last name. But if you look at the time frame, like Marco, Marcus is three years older, you probably beat him by a year or two. So technically speaking, I believe you were, when we came into this interview, we wanted to correct that. We believe that you were the first person receiving a black belt from the Gracies without the last name Gracie. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. No? Many guys, older than me, that had the, the black belt, you know. Even my some of my training partners there. Uh, for example, Paquetá, this guy, everybody know, he used to do all the videotapes. Wait, wait, wait. That's one of our questions. So let me just kind of frame this before you go down this road. Paquetá uh, was a guy that would videotape, like before the fight finders and before tapology existed, Paquetá would go and videotape everything Except he would do rival gyms. Like everybody liked him. The Luta Libre guys liked him. You know, the Carlson Gracie people liked him. And later on, even a Brazilian top team, Pocket Tau could walk into any gym and have friends videotape them. And everybody trusted him. He was a very, very unique individual and overlooked in regards to his importance in the jiu jitsu world. So please tell us about Pocket Tau. Thank you for bringing him up. Okay. So. Paquetá, first of all, his priority was videotape jiu-jitsu tournaments. Let's go suppose one weekend you don't have jiu-jitsu tournament, he could go videotape something else. But his priority was always jiu-jitsu. And I remember when in 1992, Carson Grace was invited to organize a tournament at a huge gym that opened in Brazil. It's like a club, right? They have tennis indoor courts there, you know, huge weight rooms, gymnastic rooms and all the stuff there. And to promote this school there, they decided to do a jiu-jitsu tournament outdoor. You know, we have to hire the, the bleach to put around and make the, the area to put the mats on the top. It was a lot of work and custom was not very well organized. So he called me to do this organization for this tournament there. So it took me like almost three months to set up everything, to make it happen nice. And was a huge success. In 92, just for you have an idea, we have around the 800 competitors in this competition. 
Wow. That was very rare. This never, never happened. But I was friend with people from all the schools. So it was easy for me to make the contact to convince the guys to bring the students for the competition. It was very good, amazing competition. Paquetá, you know, all the fights there, this, uh, one of the main fights of this tournament was Valide, fight uh, half grace in the brown belt, right? <laughs> so health and Walid was the, one of the, the super fights. Yeah, no, not super fights. We didn't have super fight at the time. Why is okay. in the category of the weight and- perfect. So they just, they met. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. I remember my despair was purple belt, Alan Goyes was brown belt. I even got a uh, sponsorship from Atama, Geese, for them, for the tournament, you know? So I'm friends with Mauro Porto, the owner of Atama. He usually uh, used to sponsor some of the students of Carson there, too, and even Carson Grace. So let me ask so what you, happens? we bought, we bought wait, give, wait, give wait, me a wait, second, wait. Mike. Hold on, because I want to ask about Paquetau, because you started to say, that Pakatao was one of the early black belts. Why don't you tell us, we know about his videoing. Why don't you talk to us about his fighting or, or jujitsu, at least, so that we learn about that? Uh, first of all, Paquetá used to work in a place that is uh, a corrections for kids, right? And he used okay. to teach jiu-jitsu in, in that location there. I even fought one of his students in this tournament in 1973. So anyway, he didn't uh, go too much to Carson Grace Square at the time because he was involved in his work there, right? So I believe Pakata started to train more at the Grace Academy in downtown a long time ago. And him and many other people, you know, because when I arrived at the Carson Grace School, the black belts there was Carley Grace, Rocian Grace, both Carson brothers, right? Hazel Grace was there too. And have other guys, Walter Guimarães was black belt, Sergio Willis was brown belt when I started. And, you know, don't have other black belts. And later he gave it to Tony de Padua, some other guys, you know. But everybody way older than me. I don't even know if they're still alive. Sergio Will is not alive anymore. And some of the guys passed away because of the age, right? So, but I believe I was number 17 student of Carson Grace to receive the, the black belt. And I was now a uh, few weeks ago, I awarded with the red belt. I'm the third Carson Grace student to get the red belt. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't believe Pedro Sawa was the, the first one because, how I said, I told you all these names, you know, got the belt before him. No, that, that, that's okay. You know, we're, we're correcting some issues with, with the history and, you know, it's greatly appreciated because you, you don't want to snub people that that came before you that are you know, just as deserving. You had mentioned Walid and Helson meeting in the tournament. How oh. heated was that match? Walid and Half. And yeah, Half, Walid I apologize. Got to the victory, you know, but it's tough to fight because Half Grace is very good, very aggressive fighter, you know. But by the rules, Walid won the fight. Wow. Oh. Did, were, did you attend the Hickson Gracie fight on the beach with Hugo Duarte? Were you there? No, I, I was not there. You know. W what did I, you hear about that when it went down? Well, I don't know. I heard that, that Hickson came down and Hugo Duarte saw him coming and start to get ready because he knew something was going to happen, you know. <laughs> And they started the fight. It looks like Hugo Duarte took him down and he swept Hugo Duarte and came to the top. And Hugo Duarte asked, asked to stop. It, more or less the story, right? So, stories have many versions. You know, when I don't see the things, I don't like to talk about it too much because. For sure. For sure. <laughs> it's not I... my business. <laughs> sure, sure. Hey, if I could ask you. 
and Michael stopped me, I guess, if I jumped too far ahead. But if I could ask you, who was the first of the Carlson students? Like, when was the decision made, okay, move to the United States or move to Canada? Yes. You know, like, where is it? Because, you know, Henzo went to New York. You know, Horion was in California. You, you know, you were in Vancouver. Pedro Sauer was in Utah. Like, that exodus started early. Like, who was the first? How did you become a part of that exodus? Yes. So, uh, what happened? The first person to leave Brazil to teach Jiu Jitsu was Carly Grace in 1972. Right? Wow. After that came Horio. I don't know, 73 or 74, something like that. Right? So he went to the States. But Carly was there already. So Carly is the first one in the States. Did he open up a school? I'm not sure. I, I believe you. both of them, when they came to the States, they used it to arrange the garage to teach Jiu-Jitsu. Okay. That's right? awesome. So, That's good. Because nobody knew Jiu-Jitsu. They didn't know if we're going to have the students, how we're gonna, they're going to make the price to, of, to open a gym and make money to live, right? So. <laughs> so, Marcos, let me just paint the picture. Were they in California? Yeah, in California. So imagine in California, two very in shape gentlemen invite you to the garage to wrestle so they can choke you out. <laughs> that is, that's a difficult thing to convince somebody of. So, so go ahead. No, I understand that. I agree with you. you no, know, but <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is, my friend. It was like that before. If some guys came, you know, and Hoyu is more. Uh, talk more and more open to the media and stuff like that. And he started to meet people from Hollywood, you know. Carle is more quiet, you no, know, it's not uh, like Hollywood about uh, talk too much, right? So, but anyway, and mm -hmm. Hollywood started to get famous, you know. He met Chuck Norris and after that he started to grow the things. Uh, the Machado brothers, that are cousin of the Graces, came to the United States too, and you know, and everybody started to come. The thing started to become popular when the after the UFC, right? So everybody want to learn Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and where are the instructors in Brazil? Everybody, so they start to invite people to come, and that's how I end up in Canada. Someone came to Brazil, did some private classes with me, said, oh, your skills to teach are very amazing. We would like to invite you to go to Canada. I thought it was a joke. I didn't even believe it, first of all, right? So, but later they call me, and I end up here in 97, and I'm here now 25 years and a half. That's it. I have a group of more than 20 black belts here in the country now, you know? And always very respected as used to be a custom grace black belt too, because I follow the same style. You get what you deserve. You are not FedEx Jiu Jitsu, don't deliver the night in fast, my friend. People want the belts and stripes, they have to wait and leave the blood and sweat on the mats. The only way. Was there meetings in regards to where people would go? Was it calculated or did it just happen? No, 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 no. Never happened. This, you know, and even I know because I don't know. The most important thing, in my opinion, when you go to martial arts is to learn loyalty and respect, right? So if you, my friend have a school somewhere, I'm never gonna open school closer to him, you know, but people started to get crazy with these opportunities to leave Brazil and come to the States. They didn't respect the night. Sometimes the guy open one school beside the other school of the other guy, you know, and they got upset with this, you know. Even I think so, Carson first school in the States, was closed at uh, La Cienega. I, I remember, the, I don't remember the other Christ Street, but I remember it was La Cienega. And was kind of closed the Hickson Grace School. Hickson got a little upset with this, you know, but man, 
California have five million people, you know, have students for everybody. It doesn't matter how many schools have in California now. I don't even know, maybe 200 or even more. Only yeah. San Diego maybe have 50, you know, I've heard about that. But should it be respectful, you know, keep one area for everybody, uh, to everybody have students, you know, but everybody want to go to the same spot there. Oh, San Diego have the waves, have this, have that, so let's go there. Now have over 50 schools there. So, okay. Yeah. So it wasn't it wasn't calculated. Everybody just left, and wherever they wound up, they wound up. It just so happened. Yeah, people to... follow the opportunity to come to them, right? So it's not about that the invitation or opportunity, right? So, so what brought you to Canada then? How I told you, someone from Canada came to Brazil for a wedding, and he stopped by at the gym to do some private classes. I was the lucky guy because I was there. They booked the class with me. Could it be somebody else, right? So, and this lady that came there he used to help one guy in Vancouver that had a gym and had some few classes with Horium Grace before and opened the school here, right? The guy was blue belt at the time, but he didn't know nothing. I had to take the bad habits of the guy to teach properly. And that's how we start everything, you know? And when I arrived in, in Canada, this guy uh, kind of lied to me because he said, oh, I have school in Vancouver, come here. When I arrived here, his school was in Abbott's, no, Alder Grove is a city. This big here have one street, one gas station, one supermarket, everything one. So. Right? I thought it's very you, small. I came from Rio de Janeiro, my friend, from Copacabana Beach. <laughs> Go to this place here, everything one. I got a little crazy here, you know, because I was expecting something bigger. And But anyway, when I came to Canada, uh, they introduced me in a tournament. The same day that I arrived here, that I was arriving in Canada, I was going to teach Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Everybody would like to learn, but no teachers here in Canada. I was the first black belt to open school in the country in 97. So, and one of the guys came to me to do a private class. He invited me to go teach in Vancouver because he had a school with somebody else there. And this guy, instructor, he was invited to go working the Ninja Turtle movie. He was a karate guy and teach some Japanese Jiu-Jitsu, right? So, and they had 50 students. So I took the place of this guy to start to teach and I started the gym in Vancouver with 50 guys. So lucky me, right? So because I was going to depend on the guy that invited me here with his little gym in Other Grove, I wouldn't make money not even to pay my phone call to Brazil. At that wow. time, no WhatsApp, no night, right? So <laughs> you have to pay what you have to pay. Right. And so I it, And I started like that. That's awesome. Is this where you met Dennis Kang? Yes. Dennis came to my school. I was teacher already there for two <laughs> months, right? And the methodology that I have to teach with the uh, with the technical progressions of the techniques to make it for the student to understand. In two months, I had some tough students already, you know? And then he came, he came from Hapkido, and he thought it was very good, but the guys were beating him, you know? But like Carson, I have what you call in Brazil, clinic eyes. I told it to my friend, that was watching the, the Dennis fight with me. I said, look at this guy here. He's losing to, to the guys here. But this guy is going to be my best student. And I was not wrong. <laughs> so he was my first black belt, you know, uh, have experience, fight all over the world. He went to Brazil, to Russia, to Japan, to Korea, Hawaii, everywhere, Korea, you know. So a lot of fights. Well, well, if you look at Dennis's beginning of his fight career, it, it's 
it's not impressive. And he tried to quit several times. We had him on the podcast. He's like, yeah, I tried to quit several times, but Marcos, you know, Marcus kept telling me, no, keep pushing forward, keep pushing forward. Mm-hmm. And he's like, essentially, he said, they saw something in me that I couldn't see. What, what was that? I had to give some glasses for him to see better, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, look here, what happened. Like Carson, I know when the guy has the talent to do the yeah. thing, right? So, and I encourage Dennis to keep it training because I knew he was going very far in this game, you know? So what happened? His first fight was he in Vancouver, was kind of illegal, right? The it, was, it was run by biker gangs. That's, yeah. that's what it was, okay. They had to pretend it was a, a moving set, you know, and the fight was <laughs> not real. And the police was standing all over the place there, but they, they couldn't tell, right? So anyway, at this time, Dennis fought one student of Morris Smith that at that time he was the UFC champion, right? So he beat Mark Coleman, he kicked Mark Coleman on the head and brought his students. And then he was a little bit worried. He said, oh, this guy's jump off the UFC. I'm going to fight his students. I said, my friend, I calm him down, you know, <laughs> because then his worst enemy was himself. Sometimes he didn't believe in his, himself. I have to inject confidence on him. He go to the fight. But anyway, he beat the guy in 14 seconds, no problem, you know. And the bikers got upset because they bet on the other guy. Everybody thought, oh, the student <laughs> of the champ of the FC. And I told the guy, nice to meet you. Don't bet against Carson Grace anymore. So, so the, the movie... Fight, everybody came talk to me, said, oh, I put money on Dennis, you know. <laughs> so the movie ending didn't go the way they, they wanted. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. So let's... Let's talk about just how far, like if you look at Dennis's first 10 fights, there's ups, downs, and then he starts to believe what Marcus tells him. And you see the gears change. One of the most impressive things on Dennis's incredible career was on June 4th, 2006, you were in his corner when he fought Marilla Rua. Yes. Did you, they, he, Dennis knocked out Hua in 15 seconds. They both threw at the same time. And it was, he put the entire world on notice that day. Mm-hmm. What do you recall about that fight? Well, two things uh, special about this fight, okay? First of all, uh, this fight for me was very important because... Uh, this for me was a revenge because him, he beat Marius Perry, one of the top Carson Grace fighters, right? So Murilo uh, Ninja, he beat Marius Perry. And for me, it was like a revenge. I said, then he's have to pay back. And the second, uh, I don't know if you see, but the shoot box guys, they have a very different style to post the hands when they fight. They put it beside of the head because they throw a lot of punches like that, right? Yeah. So, to defend here. I said, Dennis, I created the strategy for this fight. And if you see, he did exactly what I told him because he used to believe me, right? I said, when the fight starts, you're going to run to the center of the ring because he likes to run and take the control of the fight from the center, right? But you're going to be there before him. When he comes close to you, you're going to push kick him because he's going to come back crazy to you. And you just wait, my friend. When he comes close back to you, you're just going to throw one straight punch because they are open the face. They only defend the... Side the punch here, the Christ, right? So, and the punch didn't even connect very well because you can see slip through the head here. 
but it was enough to stunt him because when he was running, then he throw the punch. So the impact is stronger when the guy's coming to you, right? So and after that, when he fall, was easy to destroy, right? So this was a big one for me. And the next fight was very important too because we did another revenge. A Marcelo Loev destroy Murilo Bustamante. That was another great student of Castle Grace. He was even UFC champion, right? So, and then he, he school this guy stand up and choke him with one arm. You have the videos to see the fight, right? <laughs> and the Russian blood on the, the dragon tattoo of mm -hmm. tennis on the arm here. You no, know, look like the dragon is <laughs> spitting blood there. <laughs> Well, it's funny. So those two fights very important for Dennis' okay. career, you know, and to okay. him to the world. What about after the fights in the hotel? Were the other Brazilians on the other side of the ring, were they taunting or were they angry with you? No, 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 no. Uh, I met Rafael Cordeiro, right? Okay. The other guy, Rudimar Fedrigo, okay. a very friendly guy, I didn't even talk to him, but Rafael Cordeiro, Shogun and Ninja, very friendly. Even when they saw me one year later in Brazil, in the Jiu-Jitsu World Championship, they came all the way, shake my hand, very polite guys. I only have good things to talk about them. Guys, uh, let me let me take you back a little bit though. Let me yeah. let me jump in here because now you mentioned like some of these, re, re, these revenge matches, and you we're also talking oh. shoot box. Let's go back to 1997. Carlson Gracie's top student is a guy named Vitor Belfort. Yes. That fought another Vanderlei Silvas coming at you just like this. So were you in Brazil for that fight? How and, and also talk no, about the no, politics no. of where Vitor came from. No, no, I was not in Brazil. Uh, Vitor, for example, uh, he left Brazil very young. He was 17, I believe. And he fought in the tournament, the, one of my last tournaments I organized in Brazil as a blue belt, right? He fought yeah. against Chuchu, is the nickname of the guy, Murilo Bustamante student. And this guy school Vitor on the tournament twice, 30 something zero the fight, right? So, Ooh, anyway, but Vitor is a guy have multiple talents, you know. And when he came to Canada with Carson, he met this guy, Art David, and he started to practice boxing because Carson always pro boxing, you know. I said, all of my fighters have to do boxing too to, you know, be a complete fighter, right? So, right. And this guy told the castle, man, this boy here have amazing talent. He can be a professional boxing fighter if he wants. But the, the plan at the time was Vitor to be in MMA, right? So if Vitor started to train with him, of course, trained jiu-jitsu with the guys from Castle in the United States at this time. Rodrigo Medeiros was there. I think so, Alan Góes, Serjão, a few other guys, you know. And he kept training jiu-jitsu, but giving a lot of uh, training to the boxing. And you see, all his fights, he won with the boxing, not with jiu-jitsu. He beat uh, Fratelli, huh? he beat Scott Ferroso, he beat uh, the other big guy, I forgot his John name. John Hess. No, John Hess, too, but another guy in the UFC. Scott Ferroso. Scott Ferroso, Tank Albert, and one more. Oh, oh Fratelli, huh? Uh, Trey Tully, yeah. Yeah, right? Okay. So, Miguel, we're going to history and Boxing, he's about right? to stump us. Thank you. <laughs> So, no, that's awesome. So, so Vitor started really training once he came to the United States at around 17. Yes. Before that, he only did jiu-jitsu, you know, no boxing, no nothing, right? So, but in the States, things are more uh, professional than in Brazil, right? Yeah. So, Mar yeah. Marcus... Like, his boxing coach is, is an old, crusty boxing guy named Al Stanky. Yeah. Okay. 
from that the was 70s. His original boxing coach. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Frank, yeah, is the guy. I confused the names here. I said that. Ah, Dark David. Yeah. The guy did the yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Marcus, I'm really glad you cleared this up. Miguel and I, sometimes we have crazy theories, and we had always imagined, you know, like sometimes in like the Little League World Series, they don't allow the Dominican teams to play because their birth certificates are always kind of off, or a Cuban athlete, they lie about their age. Miguel and I swore when Peter Belfort came to the UFC, he was like 30 years old. Like he wasn't, he wasn't like a teenager because he was just so, so jacked and big. <laughs> yeah. Big mistake, right? So his, his fight with Randy Couture was a joke, my friend. They had to put a chair in the middle of the octagon. The guy be seated there. My opinion is very embarrassing this, you know. But why? He didn't follow Carson Gracie instruction, right? So Carson said, stay away from these products, you know, stop to lift weights, you know. Carson know what he say, you know. Mm -hmm. wow. But when wow. we are young, we think we know everything. We sometimes don't like to listen to people with more experience. And that's exactly what happened with Dennis. You guys talk about his ups and downs. Uh, the three fights he lost in a row, he went uh, uh, to the high altitude. I said, man, don't go there because you needed to be there at least one week to adapt your body and your blood cells to perform well there. You're going to get tired in the fight, so don't go. And he decided to go. I couldn't even go with him that time because my work visa was kind of expired here. I was waiting for another document. If I left Canada, I couldn't come back, so I couldn't go with him. And exactly what I told him happened, you know? Yeah. Now, I, I got I got one more revenge co uh, conversation like this. You mentioned Maurice Smith and how, you know, you mentioned he fought Coleman and things. But what you didn't mention is he also fought Conan who is, I believe, a student of yours, Conan Silvera. Yes, yes. So you he knew him very well. With uh, Marcio. Marcio Santos is a good friend I have in Brazil. We even have a school together in Copacabana. He runs the school called MSA, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And Conan and his brother Marcelo used to train with us there, you know, together with me and Marcio there, you know. Very tough guys, but Marcel finished the gym and we send all the students to go train with Castro because we always represent Castro. We didn't have any names of the gym, nothing like that, right? We just help Castro to have better warriors to the fights. So, wow. And when did the when did the Silveras go to Florida? Like around the same time or? No, he came before me. Uh, when I came to Canada in 97, I stopped five days in Miami to, to visit him and talk to him about business because I had no experience how to run a gym here, you know. And they invited me to stay there, right? I said, That's very classic. Oh, we have one student here, very rich. I believe it was Dan Lambert, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if we stay here, he opens school for you, you know. I was black belt 50 degree at the time in 97. He said, no, you have to stay here. I said, man, I can't. I, I told it to Carson, we're going to open the Carson Grace team in Vancouver, Canada, have zero black belts there, you know? So that's the reason I didn't stay. When I go to, after that, I went to LA to finalize with Carson everything about the start of the Carson Grace team there, right? So, and one day, Rodrigo Medeiros, the student, uh, had to go pick up Vitor in the airport, and he asked me to teach the class for him. So, his students liked so much my style to teach. <laughs> they took my passport and said, you're not going to Canada, you're going to stay here to teach for us, you know? <laughs> That's funny. I said, I'm sorry, I, I swear I come back here, but I have to go to Canada now because I'm open something for Carson there, you know? <laughs> and they gave my passport back, but 
this school of Castro didn't last too much. I don't know what happened. I think so he had a bad uh, partner there in the business, you know? So anyway, didn't yeah. come out, you know? Right, right. And so, I in Canada, and here I am, my friends. You know, right. we have three schools here now and keep working hard. The many representatives here in Mexico, Holland, and South Africa. Wow. I, I've got one more Dennis Kane question. We have, he fought in Pride Bushido at November 5th, 2006. It was a tournament to, to create a champion. Yeah. You were in his corner. There's a bit of controversy here. And like I said, Miguel and I really like to, to read into things. We think this is uh, some corruption in regards to what took place. So he beats Akihiro Gono by decision. Uh -huh. He beats uh, you know, Akihiro Gono's from Gravaka Dojo. And he goes into fight uh, Kazuma Saki, except Paulo Filo was on the other side. Paulo Filo armbars uh, his opponents in nine minutes, walks from the, the ring without a limp. Dennis, however, has torn his bicep off. There's some exactly. serious issues happening in the locker room. Paulo Filo pulls out because he hurt his knee, even though you can see he walked from the ring unabated without injury. And Kazuma Saki comes in, a person that had lost to Paulo Filo. Yes. And Kazuma Saki is given a split decision. Do you think Wanderlei Silva publicly stated that Paulo Filo was paid not to compete against Dennis Kang, so the Japanese opponent can come in and get his hand raised? Well, in Japan, everything is possible, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know, because if you stop to analyze, if you're going to fight, what are you going to use more in the fight? Your arm or your leg? So, Paulo Filho had a bad leg, but Dennis had a bad arm. Right? He totally ripped the tendon of the biceps, right? Yeah. So I believe, in my opinion, that you use the arms way more. You punch with the arms, you choke with the arms, you arm lock with the arms, you know. The only move you do with your legs, kick and triangle choke, nothing else, right? So the arm is more important. Then it would be in disadvantage against Paulo Filho with both injuries there, you know? But I don't know. In Japan, everything is possible, you know? But what I heard, because I know the guys from American Top Team and Brazilian Top Team, so is that Paulo Filho decided don't fight. But, but if the guys gave money to him or no, so don't come, you know? I don't know. And I think so is wrong, pride bring the loser to fight the Dennis, you know? Mike Davis, Miguel Dorani, Lights Out Podcast. We are done with another deep dive, and uh, we have Marco Suarez in the books, a jiu-jitsu legend, Mike. We're in well, new territory. This is what we're thinking. First and foremost, man, Marco Suarez is an absolute gentleman. Dennis Kang helped us out. Incredibly grateful for that. The members of the Underground Forum, so... If you guys go to mixedmartialarts.com, go to the little hamburger thing, go to the underground forum. Um, if you're listening to this podcast, you're not a Reddit person because Reddit is just kind of a lot of people that pretend like they know what they're doing. The most jaded mixed martial arts crowd in the entire, like in, in the entire internet in one spot is at the underground and they support our podcast and we're eternally grateful. So that, that, that let's get that out of the way, our shout outs. So, all right. Every other Thursday, we're going to start knocking out some of these jujitsu guys. Um, we got a couple people lined up, a couple, I guess, low hanging fruit. We're going to scoop them up, and there's going to be some pretty big jujitsu names. And we're going to be talking about like what took place in Brazil prior to UFC one, like what the scene was like, the beach fights, the dojo storming. And um, Marcos is kind of like the first person down that path that we're going down. So, Dennis Kang, thank you. But a good interview, Miguel. What'd you think? For sure. You know, what we're dealing with there is an elder statesman. 
yeah. you know, and 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 after, you know, the for me was a treat of, of catching up and, and interviewing Ron Tripp kind of on the wrestling side. I I, I thought getting a jujitsu person, uh, you know, similar to Ron Tripp, where we don't know much about their competition. We never saw them fight the way, you know, MMA is or anything like that, but they, their influence is, is felt deeply. And uh, I wanted to bring that out. And you just decided Marco Suarez is one of the perfect guys to do that with. You know, definitely a forefather. He's talking about, you know, starting training in 1970 kind of thing. So, you know, we're, we're talking about a guy who'd been around for a very long time. And I wanted to get a feel for that. We got our first feel of Brazil. I think we'll get more. I think we'll get deeper into it. I think Marcus, you know, wasn't a hothead. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll interview a hothead next time who was at the – you know, at the forefront of the gym crashing and stuff like that. But uh, uh, I thank Marcus for the lesson. That's how I for feel. Sure. For sure. So the other people that we've got kind of on our short list, Ricardo Liborio, Pedro Sauer, um, we're using our contacts to uh, kind of get in touch with them as well. Um, no, it was good. It's fun. You know, when you talk about the Brazil days, I, I think what helps also is whenever you have somebody that's a little accent heavy, um, if we repeat the names with our English spin on them, I think it kind of helps us like you and I um, a little bit more, but that Sergio Iris is a guy that was said was like, not only the real deal, he was supposed to be the best Brazilian Jiu Jitsu practitioner ever in Brazil. And you know, he passed early. So I'm really glad that, uh, you know, we got that confirmation out of, uh, out of Marcus. Yep, the, you know, that's the thing that I think is missing to a lot of the American modern jiu-jitsu fans is the history. And I think that, you know, when you step into that world, you'll find that there's a real rich history and it's worth looking into. It's a lot of fun, actually. So, like I said, my hat's off to Marcus Suarez, a pioneer, the guy who helped bring the sport to the Northern Hemisphere, you know, kind of thing back in the day. And, uh, you know, you can't get more deeply into the roots of American jiu-jitsu, North American jiu-jitsu, than Marco Suarez. Thank you, Marco. Absolutely. So I I'm going to tell you something, Miguel, what's happening. We've had several people tip us out on my cash app, which is found in the, uh, the summary. Miguel put my cash app in there. And um, we've got a few tips in the last couple of weeks, and it's greatly appreciated. Uh, it certainly helps pay our bills here and allows us to continue uh, pushing forward. So... Ladies and gentlemen, Miguel, I think that's a wrap. We have Marco Suarez in the books. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.